Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a December edition of the Veterinary Roundtable, and I'd like to welcome, all, welcome you all to the virtual room. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it just seems like I keep going on with the, the virtual everything, but someday, hopefully, we can get together in, in, in person. Um, I think, um, yeah, let's just go ahead and, and, and get started. Um, we've got a couple of, of presenters and then uh, I'll, I'll start presenting um, my cases. But um, uh, at first, I think uh, Arlene wants to give an update on um, some of the African swine fever stuff that's going on. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity um, to present an update on the African swine fever. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can, can you see it okay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, I just wanted to give an update um, on the African swine fever, especially in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And um, so the, just a little bit background on the, on the virus, it's in the family Aspiraviridae in the genus Aspivirus. It's a very large um, envelope and a very complex DNA virus. The genome encodes for over 150 proteins, and it's the only um, arbo DNA virus. So it can um, it can replicate in um, soft ticks in the in the natural cycle with um, with warthogs in Africa. And the P72 is one of the major proteins on the um, capsid and it can vary there's some um, 20 genotypes and they can vary in virulence from very high virulence with up to 100 percent mortality to low virulence where you get persistent infection and the genotypes one and two are the um, genotypes that have been outside of Africa so that's one of the reasons it can be really hard to um, to detect it initially that it might not cause um, really high mortality in all cases, it might have a much slower progression. Um, it's, it's also resistant in the environment, especially at lower temperatures. So it could survive for a period of time, like in, in carcasses, in um, like wild boar carcasses in, in Europe and, and Russia, they've had spread in, um, in wild boar. It can survive several days in, in um, feces and contaminated pens, um, up to 18 months in blood. And, and in pork products, so that's one of the risk factors for introduction is ham or other pork products that might be um, brought in from other affected countries or um, there's a risk now to um, from spread from the Dominican Republic and Haiti over to um, Puerto Rico. So that's one of, the, um, one of the main areas where there's been a lot of surveillance increase and also um, monitoring with um, Customs and Border Protection so the species affected, it's, it's only the family suidae, it's um, domestic pigs. Um, and then in, in the US, one of the big risks would be feral swine. Um, and in other countries, the wild native pigs like Eurasian wild boars, warthogs, bush pigs, and then um, and giant forest hogs. So, so in, in Europe and Russia um, and parts of Asia, the, the wild boar have been one of the um, kind of reservoir hosts where it's, it's it's been maintained in wild boar for, for several years. So it, it, the pathogenesis, it enters um, via the oral or nasal route after it, or after a tick bite, it replicates in the tonsils or the lymph nodes, um, spreads to um, lymph and um, blood and secondary organs, and then it replicates in macrophages, monocytes, endothelial cells, um, and causes a severe leukopenia. And, um, a secondary immunodeficiency and secondary infections with um, hemorrhages, splenomegaly, pulmonary edema, can, can get dis uh, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, and it, it can replicate, replicate in soft ticks. And, um, and it, there, there could be soft ticks in the US where it could, um, could be host to the virus. So it clinically, um, you get fever with anorexia and listlessness, um, huddling, piling of swine, um, can get vomiting and diarrhea, um, conjunctivitis, anorexia, um, reddening of the skin and extremities, 
um, cyanosis, and it can progress to um, incoordination and paddling. And death can be um, within six to 13 days, but it can be prolonged up to 20 days. So that it can have a slow, um, a slow spread and slower mortality um, can cause abortion in pregnant sows. And uh, one of the risk factors that is that pigs that survive the initial infection can be virus carriers for life. So they can be um, a source of exposure to other pigs. And these, these are some pictures um, of cases with um, splenomegaly and, um, and uh, cyanosis and hemorrhage. Um, usually the transmission is, is oral nasal and all the, all the secretions and excretions from infected pigs are infectious. So there's a large amount of virus in, in blood and it can contaminate the environment. And one of the, one of the risk factors is, um, is it, um, contaminated products. So, so in some countries it can spread in, um, when um, like contaminated meat products are fed to pigs or, or one of the um, concerns for, for US um, introduction into the United States is, is a lot of um, different components of, um, of, of the swine feed is, is imported from different countries, some that have ASF, different supplements and things. So, so that's been one of the areas where they've tried to um, mediate the risk of introduction into the US. And then infected carcasses, if um, like with wild boar or feral pigs, if other pigs feed on those carcasses, they can become infected. And so, the, or, so around the world, there's um, like in, in European countries that have um, ASF in, some, in wild boar, then there's a concern of, of, of hay or, or grain products that are grown outside or dried outside that could be fed to pigs. So there's limitations with that. Um, and then at our borders, we have the um, increased monitoring of, of any flights that are coming from affected countries. We, there's limitations on import of of products from affected countries, and then you have the beagles at the airports that check for um, for things that are brought in with people's luggage. And there hasn't been any vaccine that's been effective, and that's been one of the um, one of the major major um, limitations in in um, eradicating African swine fever in different countries. And USDA, they've had um, they've been researching it for for many years um, and they they actually have four candidate vaccines and one that's um, it's a it's a recombinant vaccine that's that was based on the um, the 2007 Georgia African swine fever strain which is the strain that's that spread um, the most common strain around the world and they they deleted one of the um, the genes to form an attenuated live vaccine and they were also able to develop a cell line to grow the African swine fever virus. And in the past, they'd had to harvest swine macrophages from, from donor pigs. So it was um, you know, a slow process and difficult to get enough cells. So, so they did develop a cell line and they, um, they have had um, field testing in Vietnam with um, some partner agencies. And it, and it does look like the vaccine does have some efficacy um, for um, to prevent morbidity and mortality of the the strain that's circulating in Vietnam in Asian breed pigs. So there is there is some possibility that a, a vaccine um, you know could be developed and um, because it, it's been tried for for many many years um, and and um, so far hasn't been successful. So hopefully hopefully one of these vaccines um, will be able to be utilized. So this is the current situation in around the world as of um, 1125. And so it's broad areas of the world or have, have been affected um, for um, since 2007 around Russia and into into parts of Europe. And, um, and since 2018, China has been affected in other parts of Asia. So, um, so there's wide areas with continuing outbreaks in, um, in Europe and Asia, parts of Africa where it's endemic, and then in the, um, in the Caribbean and Dominican Republic and Haiti. So Haiti, um, their, their first report was in October of, um, of this year. They've had seven outbreaks reported in backyard farms and those are confirmed. So there's likely to be more 
um, more affected farms. Um, broad, broad, um, spread broadly across the country and along the border with the Dominican Republic. And they've, um, they have a difficult time responding because of their um, natural disasters and um, other things going on there. So it's, so it's more difficult for them to respond to the, the ASF cases. So they, um, it was confirmed at, uh, the samples were sent to the Plum Island Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab and confirmed. Um, and their control measures are um, surveillance within the, the containment and protection zones, quarantine, um, disinfecting the um, transport movement controls and selective killing and disposal of, of affected and, ex and um, exposed farms. Um, and then official destruction of, of animal products and carcasses um, from affected pigs and um, different meat products. So in the Dominican Republic, they've had 136 reported outbreaks in backyard farms. And, um, and they, they now have the capacity, they're running the majority of their samples there in the Dominican Republic with um, the, um, the Plum Island Lab um, help to, to set up um, a PCR for them. So they're running the samples there. And they, they have a lot of, um, of, of assistance from FAO and other countries that are, that are helping with, um, with expertise, with the response. And there's, there's some, some veterinary services staff that um, I think is gonna deploy to the Dominican Republic. There's been a few who have gone from, to, um, to assist with some of the epidemiology and um, some of the logistics and equipment. Um, so in the Dominican Republic, it was confirmed in July. Um, and, and they have, um, so they've, they've been um, doing surveillance, um, quarantine, movement controls, but they have some difficulty um, controlling the movement of pigs within the country. And especially now it's getting closer to the holidays, their pork is one of the, one of the main um, meat products that's important in their, in their um, holidays. So, so, that, so there's some difficulty around the holidays um, controlling movement. And they're any, um, any affected farm or exposed farms, they're um, trying to depopulate as rapidly as possible. Um, but there's some logistical problems and, um, and disposal of carcasses is, is limiting too. So, um, so they've had difficulty keeping up with, um, with stamping out and, and um, you know, pretty rapid spread in the country. So it's still um, ongoing outbreak there. And then um, worldwide, um, since January, 2020, um, ASF has been reported in, in um, Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. So in 32 countries and over a million domestic swine and um, 28,000 um, wild boar um, have been lost to so probably a lot more animals um, than that. Um, so, so currently recent recurrence in Russia and wild boar and domestic swine, um, China, also the Philippines and Hong Kong. And um, in Europe, there's ongoing, um, primarily in wild boar, but it does spill over into domestic swine. So in, in Bulgaria, um, Germany also, um, um, Poland has had um, ASF in wild boar um, for, um, for many years and, and has been generally able to contain it within wild boar without it spilling over into, into domestic swine. And there's two countries, the Czech Republic and Belgium, who are actually able to um, eradicate um, ASF from their wild boar. So they were able to, um, they used multiple methods. They fenced off the areas where they had affected wild boar. Um, they did um, uh, special hunting. They did use sharpshooters and, um, and trapping. And, and they were able to eradicate it in their wild boar, but it's difficult in all the borders um, in, in Europe, um, it's difficult to, to prevent the movement of wild boar. Um, but, but there are, they have developed quite a few techniques to, to contain it. Um, and then, um, so, but within Europe, wild boar, um, once it's in, in wild boar, it's hard to contain. And then in, um, in Rwanda, in um, 
in September. So in um, in the U.S., one of the one of the, the main concerns is um, is um, the Swine Health Protection Act is garbage feeding, which isn't isn't as widespread as it as it once was. But that's one of the things that um, is is monitored because it can be spread in in meat products. So if meat products have gotten into the U.S. and were fed to pigs without um, being heat treated before feeding, then that could be a possible route um, of infection. And especially in Puerto Rico, there's quite a few garbage feeders and there's um, boat landings from Dominican Republic and Haiti where people come over um, to, um, to try to get to Puerto Rico to get to other countries. And um, there's, there's definitely a risk from um, bringing meat products from those countries. And so they've, Puerto Rico has very um, active monitoring of boat landings. And then if there's any boat landings, they check for any meat products and then they do testing of pigs around those boat landings and they have ongoing um, control for feral pigs. Um, so, so there's been a lot of um, activity in Puerto Rico to try to prevent it from getting to Puerto Rico and, um, and getting from Puerto Rico to the US. And in New Mexico, um, uh, garbage feeding is is legal for um, for producers that are licensed and inspected, and currently there's two in New Mexico, um, two small um, farms that are licensed. Um, it's also legal in Arizona, but currently there aren't any any licensed um, feeders in in Arizona. So that's one of the activities to 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 try to um, check for any any new new farms that might be might be feeding food waste or um, restaurants that might have a lot of food waste that they might be providing to um, to farms. So um, doing outreach to um, you know on on the risk of, of feeding food waste and um, and the requirement for um, for licensing and and heat treating food waste before feeding. So these are the um, so if if they're um, if there are any any reports of morbidity or mortality in in pigs, then um, want to report those to to Dr. Zimmerman or Dr. Um, Shobalio. And then there's a lot of good resources about um, about African swine fever and outreach on the disease for um, for producers and, and veterinarians. So, thank you, and um, and I. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Antonoli that had, um, these slides are based on, on a, a slide presentation she gave. So I wanted to, to thank her for the, for the slides. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Are there any questions for Arlene? I have a question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, have we had African swine fever in the United States, number one at all, and number two, or number two recently, because um, I don't have a lot of swine in my practice, and I'm just curious. No, luckily we've we haven't we haven't ever had African swine fever in the U.S. Luckily, and um, it, even, until like 2007, it it um, it had really been pretty much in Africa and then there had been an outbreak in Spain, but it wasn't that widespread. But after 2007, it started spreading in um, the Republic of Georgia and then to Russia. And, and um, so, yeah, so luckily the US is, we haven't had any cases, but we're definitely concerned because it's, there's a lot of um, food products imported, um, animal feed. So there's a lot of risk for, for accidentally bringing it in. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So if not, I think we'll move on. Um, Tim, did you have anything to talk about this evening or, or not? No, I really didn't. But I'm, I'm glad Faith said that she's, she's not working on pigs anymore because that was my go-to place. That's who I was referring all, all the swine folks. So, so that in itself was, was worth logging in tonight. So, and there's not many swine veterinarians left out there. So, okay, I think we'll but, move. But John's saying that if anybody does have questions for me about 
anything public health related, I'll be happy to answer them yeah, anytime. Has there been like, I know Arizona really had a lot of cases of West Nile virus in, in humans and horses, but they had like, I don't know, over a thousand human cases, I think. And I don't, we, we haven't had as bad of cases, but. Um, uh, yeah, we had a we had a pretty strong West Nile year. It, it wasn't our, our top year. I think right now, and people we have confirmed or close to be confirmed about 34 cases. Um, and on the horse side, um, quite a few. I don't have that number in front of me, but but uh, yeah, we, we it was quite a few. Uh, yeah, Arizona got hit hard. All, everybody around the country did, but but certainly in in our regional area, um, yeah, West Nile was certainly was certainly. Uh, um, much stronger or much, 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 much uh, wider spread this year than, than the last couple of years. For horses, I would say 10 plus. It seems like there was quite a few. Definitely more than last year. And yeah, 10 plus is easy um, for sure. Okay. No further questions with Dr. Hanish. Uh, well, I think we'll start on our case presentations. Um, Sarah, did you want to present yours? Sure, I can go ahead. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, the current veterinarian at the New Mexico Wildlife Center. Uh, and I just finished a year long internship at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Uh, so this is not a, um, not a New Mexican species. <laughs> But I thought that it would be a good one to present uh, because it's sort of an irregular a case for this species. Uh, so sort of a reminder that weird things happen sometimes. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Clark. Uh, he was an 18 month old male castrated Virginia opossum. He was about three kegs uh, and in good body condition. He originally presented uh, to the Wildlife Center of Virginia after his mother was hit by a car. Uh, he and one other Joey in the group became habituated uh, and then they kept them on site and they became education ambassadors. Uh, so essentially little learning animals. Um, they interacted with the public a little bit. Uh, they uh, came in in the middle of 2019. So they did a lot of virtual visits in 2020, I think. Um, so as an education ambassador, pretty, pretty easy possum life. Uh, he his food is their omnivores. So uh, he had fresh and frozen vegetables. Um, we gave them a variety of commercial uh, dog foods usually do dog or cat food, but we usually did dog food. Um, and then mice or fish uh, usually went on top of that. He had water available all the time, um, multiple containers because uh, this species likes to frequently use a larger water container as a latrine. So usually we had two or three uh, water containers in his enclosure. Um, at least twice a week, he had a quick vet check. That's what the picture is. Uh, one of my students is uh, holding him for his exam with his little peanut butter enrichment treat. So um, one of the other morbidities they get commonly is frostbite on their ears and toes and tail. So that was one of the things we were checking and just ma making sure that they maintain their body condition. Uh, they also interacted with rehabbers uh, and more commonly education staff. So um, people who are sort of like, um, like the people who work on zoo staff, uh, but for a smaller collection. Um, and they did all different kinds of training, uh, target training, and uh, they used to do leash training. They stopped doing that, um, but all different kinds of things. And uh, they also had annual exams. His exam was seven months prior to this event um, and everything came back normal. Uh, he seemed like a happy, healthy little baby. Uh, I really like possums, so I'm gonna bore you guys with possum facts for a second. Uh, so their species is Didelphus virginiana. Uh, they are marsupials. They're the only North American marsupial. Uh, there are some that if you go uh, to the Southern range of Mexico sometimes or South of Mexico, there's others, but uh, the only ones here, so they're special. Uh, they aren't in New Mexico, but they're essentially uh, from the Rockies West and then parts of California, but their range is expanding all of the time. They seem like they do really well in urban and suburban habitat. Um, and 
the cold seems to be the only thing that stops them, but only sometimes. Um, they are a short-lived species, usually two or three years is their max. Um, and they are omnivores that will sort of eat whatever the heck is available, alive or dead, they'll eat carrion, um, but uh, anything available. And then there's just all kinds of fun little things about them, other than the fact that they are uh, marsupials, like um, they like to play dead. Um, the word for that is thanatosis, Dr. Hanish. I think you like fun words. Um, and um, they have 50 teeth, which is fun. That's the most of any land mammal. Um, they also have a bifurcated penis um, and the vagina and cervix on the female um, is also bifurcated. Um, also they're immune to a lot of snake venom. So some people are taking proteins uh, from the possums and then applying that um, in different ways that we can approach human and animal uh, envenomation which I think is fun. Um, it's also a super common rehab species in the states where they're prevalent. Um, when I looked back through the Virginia data, most commonly they present as being orphaned. When adults come in, they seem like they tend to come in due to uh, either predation or trauma, like being hit by a car. Uh, you can imagine a species that's trying to do great in suburban and urban habitats. That's what they're going to run into. Uh, they also get a variety of other things that happen to them. Um, there's a paper that came out a couple years ago about cancers um, that they get, particularly lung cancers. Um, they also get a variety of parasites. Um, and so uh, a lot of things can happen to these little guys. Uh, so back to Clark, in August 2020, uh, when everybody came in the morning, he was found deceased in his enclosure. Uh, everything had seemed really normal. He'd had a little training session the previous day, no change in food or water, no special treats or anything. Um, and everything had seemed completely normal the previous day. Um, so He's an education animal, but just generally being in a hospital setting, we want to know why he died. Uh, the first thing that we noticed, and actually a, a technician that was a volunteer, she said, why is he so bloated? And we were like, well, he died. Um, but then it seemed like that was really the main postmortem change. Uh, so we took some x-rays. The x-ray on the left-hand side of the screen um, is from his annual exam seven months prior. Uh, so you can have a normal possum rat up there. Um, and the one on the right is uh, the postmortem x-ray. It was definitely within 12 hours of death. Um, and you can see a lot of gas and ingest a distension of the stomach. Uh, there's compartmentalization at the cranial dorsal aspect of the stomach. There's some cranial displacement of the intestines. They're just getting pushed out of the way. Um, so we thought these findings were curious. Um, and here's a, actually a DV view, uh, I, in small mammal, I'm used to taking, uh, VDs, but, um, for the small mammals in a rehab setting, we very frequently take DV views. So, um, you're seeing that compartmentalization, um, and how we're extremely full of things. You can also see the epipubic bones, which is another fun possum thing. So marsupials will have those. So um, after just doing a brief glance over postmortem exam and those x-rays, our differentials were uh, gastric dilatation and volvulus, uh, some sort of neoplasia, uh, perhaps a foreign body obstruction, and then um, some sort of intestinal parasites. We did a necropsy later that morning uh, and we found many things. Um, so there was not a lot of debris or mucus in the trachea or oral cavity. Uh, the stomach was extremely distended uh, when we opened it. And then there was a torsion at the fundus. So uh, it, we, to undo it, we had to go around twice. And then based on the location of the spleen, we decided that it was a 540 degree rotation. Or um, There were no ulcerations or obstructions noted in the entirety of the GI tract. There was a line of demarcation at the mid body of the stomach uh, and there's petechiation along the outer body. And I have a second set of pictures of that for you all. Uh, the spleen was at the right dorsal aspect of the stomach um, and was fairly congested, not the worst I've seen pictures of, but um, definitely congested. Uh, and the spe spleen should not be there. Uh, it should be like a normal monogastric animal. There was a metal mouse ear tag found in the intestines and you could see that on the x-rays previously. Um, and then in the other parts of the body, really we didn't find anything significant. 
So uh, here's a closer up picture of the torsion um, right at the fundus and esophagus and it's quite there. Um, and then on the right side, we see the line of demarcation at the mid body, um, which uh, would indicate that this occurred antemortem. Uh, there's a region of petechiation, the spleen. Um, and so this is, we're looking at uh, the tail of the possum is closest to us. Um, so you can also see the bladder right beside the bladder. Um, there's a little bit of blood pooling. There's probably less than 250 mils of blood there. It wasn't a severe hema abdomen. Um, based on all these findings, we diagnose Clark with gastric dilatation and volvulus. Um, there's definitely some limits to that. Uh, we didn't see anything antemortem, um, but he had that torsion, the spleen was congested and there was that line of demarcation. So we felt quite confident in the diagnosis. Uh, so what we learned was that um, GDV should be included on the differential list for less commonly described species. Um, and there's some thought that the pathophysiology of the, of the progress that's occurring might be faster in some species. Um, it hasn't been previously described in marsupials, but it has been described in um, other non-canid species. So red pandas are one, um, a couple different types of ferrets um, are another, um, and then a few bears, but it seems like it's most common in um, dogs and pigs. Uh, so this was a new one. Um, and that's everything. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, Sarah, so this is Tim. Uh, with the exotic craze that, that's going on, are, are people trying to make pets out of these? Uh, certainly. I see them on Instagram. Um, so I think that they are less popular than raccoons, which I would say is a more worrying species, um, but they're definitely around. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from the chat about if he had any change of diet before the torsion, um, and he didn't when I looked back through everything. There was some variety built into his diet, but not a lot. Um, the quantity that he got fed uh, was also supposed to be pretty well set. Uh, there's also a question about them being immune to rabies. Um, they're not technically immune. Um, they are less likely to die from rabies um, and have a significant viremia because they have a low body temperature. Um, but it has been reported, like it could definitely happen in the lab and it's allegedly, I don't know, I never looked it up, but supposedly it has been diagnosed in wild possums as well. Uh, there's another question about if he had any increased activity. Nobody is on site all night long, so I don't know, you know, what if a predator or something had climbed the side of his enclosure and irritated him and he got stressed out and run around. That's certainly possible, um, but there's nothing that we had evidence of um, that he was had increased activity. All right. If there's no further questions, I think we'll continue on. Um, does anyone else have anything to share? So if not, I think uh, I'll go ahead and start. Okay, uh, we'll continue with the, the pig theme for a while. Um, <clears throat> this was a six months old castrated male red wattle hog. Um, I didn't know what a red wattle hog was, but they're red and they have wattles like a turkey. Um, said he weighed just shy of 35 pounds. Um, so I think there's a something wrong with the age because a six month old pig should be uh, close to market weight at 250 pounds. Um, Said he was being fed expired food and, and protein mash. Um, he was declined in health and, and body condition over a week's time. He got extremely weak and couldn't walk. Um, and then he died. Um, so when we got him at, at necropsy, he was pretty thin, um, but 
yeah, there was no way he was, was six months old, you know, maybe six weeks, eight weeks, but not six months. Um, this is not from the pig. This is actually the dog from a dog, uh, but it's a normal colon from the dog. So I'm just using that as a reference. Um, and this is um, sections of colon from, from the pig. Um, kind of notice how thick the mucosa is and it's covered by a um, kind of a brown granular uh, pseudo membrane. Um, just closer up, it's really thick. I'm covered by that, that membrane. Uh, this is a normal histopathology from that uh, dog colon. Um, notice the glands are, are typically nice and straight. Um, all these big blue vacuole things, those are, are mucus that the cells are producing. So uh, there's a lot of mucus cells in, in the colon. And this is a photomicrograph of the section of, of the, from the pig. Um, this is the, that brown granular exudate that was on the surface. Um, notice the glands, they're not nice and straight anymore. A lot of them are, are branching and, and tortuous. And there's really almost no mucus cells. And we're just getting closer up. So there might be a mucus, a few mucus cells in these, but you know, some of these are really branching and, and tortuous. So, so then that, and that's not normal. And that's um, kind of prevents the absorption and, and other um, digestive activities that the intestine is supposed to do. And this is a, a silver stain um, of that intestine. Um, so these down here in a row are the, the nuclei. But up at the top of the cells, you see these little bitty kind of curved lines. Um, those aren't supposed to be there. Those are actually intracellular bacteria. And those are actually Lawsonia intracellularis. And in addition, the, the large intestine was PCR positive for the bacteria Lawsonia intracellularis. So the diagnosis was porcine proliferative enteropathy. Um, just a little bit about the organism. Um, it is an anaerobic bacterium. It's obligate intracellular bacterium. Uh, it's pretty fastidious, so it, it's pretty difficult to, to grow. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the diagnostic... So uh, let's go back here. So a lot of the diagnostics um, post-mortem either... Um, detecting it with uh, the special stains or the, the PCR um, testing. And the uh, andamortem is the PCR testing. It's been, uh, it can affect multiple species and cause disease in multiple species, but it's best known in pigs, horses, uh, hamsters with the, the wet tail, if you remember from pet school and rabbits. So it, it affects the enterocytes of the distal small intestine and large intestine, uh, mainly the ileum. So in pigs, it's known as also known as ileitis. Um, it also causes, it mostly causes chronic diarrhea and wasting, uh, particularly in young post-warning weaning pigs and foals. Um, but also in pigs, there is a syndrome um, where uh, infected pigs will die suddenly. Um, so in those pigs, that thick um, intestine will become necrotic and the pigs will actually bleed out into the 
intestine. Um, that's called necrotic enteritis. So does anybody have any, any questions about that one? If not, we'll move on then to a goat that was wasting. Hey, John, you have a question in the chat. Okay, I don't, I don't have the chat here, so. Um, Look, I, I can read it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, can, um, can uh, Lasonia be treated with antibiotics? Um, one of the the preventives was the um, the antibiotics used for growth promotants, um, but because they those can't use those anymore um, as a preventive. Um, it, um, yeah, so there, it's it's becoming more of a problem. It was, was always a problem. Um, there is a vaccine for it, um, but as far as treating, I, I think once it um, gets established, I, I don't think the antibiotics will will treat it very well. Can can it be? Um, how is it diagnosed in um, in live animals? I uh, usually with uh, PCR testing of, of the feces. That was it. Was it a pet pig? That pig, or was it a? I'm I'm not exactly sure what what they were doing. I, I it sounded like they had multiple pigs and maybe. They, raise them as you know that breed is kind of a rare breed so maybe raise them as you know genetic stock or um you know sold them to to people for eating uh, i don't think they were pets uh, but it, it wasn't a large operation either okay thank you Hey, John, I know that it's popped up in horses before. I mean, you had that listed as species. Have, have we ever seen that, or have you ever seen it in, uh, in a horse? It was a long time ago, um, back when I was doing my residency. So maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, yeah, it was the last time I, I've seen it. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure how frequent it is in horses. Um, Thank you. Can, can people people can people get infected, or or it isn't known in in people? I don't think so, but I really don't know. Everything I've read doesn't list it as being zoonotic. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would have to say what the non-human primate was and how how closely re related they are to to humans. Um, whether that could be zoonotic or, or not, because most most of what I, I looked up was they just listed as non-human primates. So. Thank, thank you. Okay. Oh, I did find my chat button. It's hidden beneath my my camera. So, okay. Well, if there's no further questions, we'll um, talk about wasting in a goat. So this goat was eight years old, female Nigerian dwarf goat. Um, she wasn't in, she weighed 49 pounds, but I, I don't know how big Nigerian dwarf goats typically get, but when we did the necropsy, she wasn't in, in very good shape. Um, she, the history of, you know, 
ain't doing right um, and, and chronic weight loss. Uh, the CBC and serum chemistry on this goat, she had a leukocytosis. It was mainly due to a neutrophilia and a monocytosis. Um, she had a hypoproteinemia that looked like it was mainly due to hypoalbuminemia. Um, and she had a hypocalcemia, which was probably also due to the hypoalbuminemia. That's most circulating calcium is bound to albumin. She had a hypocholesterolemia and decreased creatinine. And once again, just to show you an example of what a normal piece of intestine should look like. So these aren't quite as striking as uh, the pig, but um, these are pieces of the, the small intestine from the goat. Um, you can see the, the mucosa is thickened. Uh, that one's a little red. And, and microscopically, um, these are the, the crypts. Or, and in between the crypts, there are a lot of macrophages that should not be there. And in the mesenteric lymph node, we have little granulomas. And the liver, we had quite a few small granulomas. And on the acid fast stain in the um, small intestine, uh, all of these little red dots are acid fast bacilli. And also doing PCR on the small intestine for this goat, it was positive for Mycobacterium avium uh, subspecies paratuberculosis. So this goat had paratuberculosis or Yoni's disease, whichever one you want to call it. So. And it, paratuberculosis is caused by Mycobacterium. Bacterium avium, subspecies paratuberculosis. It's most common in domestic ruminants, uh, but wild and captive non domestic ruminants, such as deer and elk, can also get the disease, as well as camelids, rabbits, equids, swine, and captive primates. Um, it's transmitted by the fecal oral route, usually when. Um, the, the domestic ruminants are, are neonates and it takes years for these lesions to develop and, and disease to develop. So, um, you know, the, when you finally get the disease and clinical signs, they're often four, five, six, seven, eight years old, but they're infected when they're, when they're neonates. Um, cattle with paratuberculosis often have severe watery diarrhea. Um, and in opposition, sheep and goats typically just exhibit wasting uh, with no diarrhea. They may have diarrhea when they're close to death, but uh, usually they just waste away. Um, the cattle also waste away, but it's, you'll notice the, the watery diarrhea first. And similar to the, the proliferative Enteropathy, um, it's mainly, lesions are mainly in the ileum and the, the large intestine. In real severe cases, it will go up into the distal jejunum. Um, and the gross lesion in the intestine is, is usually thickened, the thickened mucosa. Um, that is most prominent in cattle. Um, remember in Veterinary school people talk about the garden hose gut in cattle. Um, the lesion in sheep and goats is usually pretty subtle. And um, usually if, if you see it, it's pretty late in the disease and pretty severe disease. Um, these animals with paratuberculosis often have 
mesenteric lymphangitis. You can see the um, lymph vessels in the mesentery pretty prominently because they're inflamed. And also we'll have lymph adenitis pretty commonly. So microscopically, that enteritis is granulomatous and the number of acid fill the acid fast bacilli will vary. Um, some animals will have numerous bacilli like this goat and some will have not very many at all. Um, uh, and the lymphangitis is often granulomatous as well as the lymphadenitis. And commonly, even though you don't see it grossly, they'll commonly have microscopically, will have multifocal granulomatous hepatitis. Uh, just talk about the antemortem diagnosis of paratuberculosis real quickly. Um, it's still pretty difficult and, unless it's um, an animal is showing clinical disease. Um, serology, you can use serology. Um, there are several ser serological tests out there. The LISAs tend to be the, the best. Uh, the sensitivity for the ser serological test is greater than 85% in animals with clinical disease, but only approximately about 40% in, in non-clinical animals. Um, also, one of the better tests is detection of organisms in the feces by, by using PCR now. Um, but you still kind of run into the, the same situation as the, because the non-clinical animals don't really shed um, that many organisms in the feces. Um, so you still can run into some false negatives, but the PCR is generally more sensitive than the, than the astrology. Also, the, the culture is more sensitive um, than the astrology, but the problem with the culture is that it is slow. Um, it takes five to 12 weeks um, to isolate the, the bacteria. Um, and then also the sheep strains are, are pretty difficult to, to isolate. Um, the cattle strains are pretty easy to isolate, but they're slow. Um, the goats typically get infected with the cattle strains. So um, you can culture the bacterium from the goat, fe the goat feces, but uh, most, mostly the PCR now has, been, uh, has replaced uh, the culture. So any, any questions about the, the bear tuberculosis? Uh, there's a question in the chat. Were other goats on the premises affected? Um, not clinically that I know of, um, but I'm sure they're infected with uh, the bacteria. Um, and just to go back to my point about the serology, um, this herd had been serologically tested negative for uh, yonis. Um, not too long before this this goat got clinically ill, so it's um, yeah, serology is much better when there's when there's clinical illness when, compared to non-clinical animals. Any other questions? All right, if not, I think we'll. We'll move on here, um, talk about a cat with abdominal effusion. And actually it had in thickened intestine as well, but it's an entirely different disease process. So it's a 10 years old, spade female, domestic short hair cat. Um, it weighed 7.8 pounds, but it was still pretty Pretty skinny, he had a body condition score of about two out of nine. Uh, it was pretty, pretty dehydrated. Um, at the smitting veterinarian, um, the main complaint was the 
abdominal distension um, and abdominal effusion. Um, then there was a rapid decline in, in the cat's health and it led to death. Uh, the radiographs taken at this meeting veterinarian, um, there was a loss of abdominal cirrhosal detail, which is to be expected with all the abdominal effusion. Um, they did notice the abdominal effusion in the radiographs and they, they noticed that the intestines were kind of displaced in, in the dorsal abdomen. And the CBC and the serum chemistry on that cat. Um, it had a <clears throat> increased hematocrit and RBC count, um, which goes along with the dehydration. Uh, leukocytosis, mainly due to a neutrophilia. Uh, monocytes were all slightly increased. Um, <clears throat> increased BUN and creatinine. hyperphosphatemia, hyperkalemia, increased ALT and ALP, and it was also hyperbilirubinemic. So something going on the, in the liver, um, the BUN creatinine was probably due to dehydration. Um, so don't remember anything being terribly wrong with the kidneys. <clears throat> okay, this is just a, overview of the, the cat. Um, it, you notice the abdominal effusion. Um, it is pretty cloudy. Um, the liver is kind of lumpy and bumpy um, with quite a few masses. And then the intestines are, are kind of stuck together in a ball up in the dorsal abdomen. Uh, just a, a picture of the liver, the diaphragmatic surface and the visceral surface, um, just showing all the, the different masses in the liver. There was a large mass in the spleen. And this is the intestinal tract, a gastrointestinal tract but removed in its entirety. You can see even after remo removing it, it's still kind of stuck together. Loops are stuck together. Some of it's kind of plicated. Um, the omentum is rather thick with these red spots. Um, there's masses along the lesser curvature of the stomach and on the, the greater curvature. And in the colon, there looks like there's a, a stricture right in that area right there. So to focus in that area, um, it kind of looks like there's a annular mass in that area of the stricture and have a little bit of momentum stuck to it there. <clears throat> so on histopathology, this is that area of the, that annular stricture. Uh, normally there should be some architecture to the um, Intestine, this is the mucosa out here. Um, this is, looks like the tunica, tunica muscularis. Um, this is probably the, the submucosa, but really this architecture is pretty much gone. And uh, there's a lot of different glandular structures that are infiltrating um, the intestine. And this, this other side is just a closer up of those granular, those glandular structures. 
And this is the, the stromal uh, reaction to those glandular structures as they're invading the tissue. The tissue uh, responds with this uh, kind of the stromal reaction. And that's called desmoplasia if you're, if you're wondering. And this would kind of explain the, the liver enzymes. Um, this is the, the one of those masses in the liver with the, the neoplastic glandular structures invading the, the normal liver up here. I uh, didn't see it grossly, but uh, there was one or two uh, metastasis in the lung. And this was um, the, the mesentery. And this is kind of, this is why the intestines were stuck together. Uh, this is the cirrhosis of the mesentery. This is the, the glandular structures um, forming this desmoplastic response along the cirrhosis. Um, and with this fibrous tissue, it's just sticking uh, pieces of cirrhosis together. So, So that cat, that poor cat had a colonic adenocarcinoma with carcinomatosis and widespread visceral metastasis. Um, and just to go back, this process is called carcinomatosis where the, the, these carcinomas will metastasize throughout the, the body cavity, whether it's the, the abdomen or the, the thorax. So intestinal adenocarcinomas are, of our domestic species, they're most common in cats. Uh, they most commonly occur around 11 years of age. Um, they can occur in the small or large intestine. Um, there's some studies that say they occur greater percentage in the small intestine and some others counteract that and say there's contradict that, say that they occur most commonly in the large intestine, but most people will say there's no preference or predilection site for either one. And most of the time, um, they occur as intramural masses that form an annular ring around the intestine and, and form a structure, um, such as what happened in this case. So these guys typically don't have a very good prognosis. Um, by the time that they're diagnosed, most cats will have metastasis. Uh, most commonly, uh, it is to the, the peritoneum, uh, through carcino carcinomatosis, and the regional lymph nodes, the mesenteric lymph nodes. Um, but they can metastasize also to the liver, spleen, and, and lung. Um, just, this is not my forte, but I'll go into it a little bit. Um, the treatment of choice is surgery, um, but the median survival times that have been reported in the literature after surgery vary very wildly. Um, ranging from 68 to 450 days. Um, but most cats will end up dying from metastatic disease um, even after, after surgery. This 450 day report was probably cats that were caught pretty early. So. And that's all I have on, on that case. So are there any questions? All right, so I guess there's none. So um, we'll um, move on and talk about sudden death in a, in a puppy. So it was a, a three weeks old male mixed breed dog. Um, he, was, he was one of a litter of, of three. Um, and this 
guy was found dead with no prior illness um, at the time he was submitted for for necropsy. Uh, the other other two litter mates were were doing fine. And the gross lesions, they were most prominent in the, in the kidneys. And you can see all these petechia in the kidneys. And that's pretty pathognomonic for this, this disease, which you know, I'll go into later. But, and on, when you cut the kidney open, um, you'll see the, the areas of hemorrhage and um, actually when you look at it microscopically, those are areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. So. <clears throat> and going to the microscopic lesions, this is normal kidney, uh, the glomerulus, the, the tubules are pretty much intact. Um, there's a little bit of postmortem change to this to this kidney, so it's not as clear as it should be. But those are those. This is one of those red areas in that that puppy's kidneys. Um, so this is a glomerulus tear. Um, it's not looking very good. Um, but there's hemorrhage uh, and all these. kind of pink homogeneous the structures used to be tubules. In addition to the um, hemorrhage and necrosis in the kidney, you also see it in the liver and the lung. And you can also see it in adrenal gland and, and several other places. But uh, the kidney, liver, and lung are, are typically the most common. And the kidney was PCR positive for canine herpes virus one. Um, and yeah, those petechia on the the in the kidneys of a one to three week old dog is is pretty pathognomonic for herpes virus. Viremia. And the diagnosis was canine herpes virus viremia. So the, the canine herpes virus is an alpha, alpha herpes virus. Um, it's transmitted from an infected dog to a susceptible dog in the oral, nasal, and vaginal secretions. Um, the problem usually comes when little puppies are infected um, in the age of one to, one to three weeks. Um, and when clinical illness develops, um, it's usually short, less than 24 to 48 hours of duration, but a lot of puppies will just die suddenly. Um, And it is a temperature de dependent virus. Uh, and that's why this, the sudden illness is, illness and sudden death is more severe in, the, in these young puppies because they can't regulate their, their body temperature very well. So once they get above three weeks, they can regulate their body temperature and, and stay warm enough where the virus doesn't replicate um, and go viremic. Um, but when these puppies get chilled, they can become viremic and die pretty quickly. So when a naive older dog is um, infected, it's usually just a mild rhinitis, just written off as, as kennel cough. Um, but when there's a naive pregnant female infected, um, it can result in abortion or partially stillborn litter, um, where some of the effect puppies were infected and, and died, but others weren't infected. So. And the lesions in those puppies would be similar to the lesions in, in this puppy, the aborted puppies or the stillborn puppies. So I think that's 
you know, on that one. So um, any any questions about that? John, how common, common is it to see a single pup in a litter come down with this? Or would you expect multiples in the litter? I would expect multiples. I, I assume the other others died shortly thereafter this one. Um, I, yeah, I can't remember of a, usually when we get them um, for necropsy, there's multiple puppies that, that have died in the litter. I don't, I don't know what people see clinically, but. Um, But yeah, usually when we get them, there's multiple. Thank you. And you have questions in the chat. Yeah, I saw that. Um, there's a question. Um, is it common in New Mexico? Do you see it in kennels and humane society? Um, it's common everywhere there are dogs. Um, so yes, it is common in, in New Mexico. It's it's a, a pretty common virus in, in dogs. Um, it, um, yeah, it, it's most dogs, it, it causes no problems at all. Um, like I said, it, usually if they're make it through the puppy phase of not, um, not being infected with, if they are exposed, they will develop a mild rhinitis um, sometimes, but most of the time it, it's inapparent. Um, and like all herpes viruses, it's, it's as a latent infection and then is intermittently shed. Um, do you see it more in, in kennels or the Humane Society? Um, I, I, that, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. I would probably say yes, because there is a greater concentration of dogs in an enclosed area. Um, but I, I'm not sure if, you know, that's a um, really correct way to, to answer that. Um, because it's it's pretty common in, in the dog population worldwide. Um, the next question is any good testing strategies for the bitch before breeding or, or pregnant? Um, you know, if if you're you're really con concerned about it, if not having a, a naive uh, having a naive e female. Um, before she was pregnant, I, there are serology tests for it, I, I believe. Um, that would probably be, be the, the easiest to perform. Um, but I, I, yeah, I don't really work with that many, many breeders anymore. People who do might be able to, to answer that question better, but it's, um, I don't know if any breeders actually worry about it too much because it is so common. Um, unless they do happen to have an abortion or, or something like that. Uh, another question is older dams may have immunity to herpes virus and pass to puppies in the, in the colostrum. Um, yeah, I, there is, um, uh, let's try to, I'm trying to answer your question while, while remembering what I read about it. Um, yeah, there is some uh, claustral immunity that's um, passed on to the puppies. Um, but I'm not sure how um, 
effective that is because it's um, just from the literature I read, most puppies are infected when they're they're neonates, um, and you know most do well, and some do not. So, so any other questions? Well, if not, I think we'll go on here and we'll uh, switch gears to a little larger animal. Um, it was uh, estimated approximately four years old, male mule deer. Uh, he's pretty poor body condition. Um, he was noticed to be walking around in, in tight circles counterclockwise, um, but he was often bedded down and approachable by humans, which um, for deer is never a good thing. Um, the people who observed him noticed he held his head at an angle and actually noticed uh, an asymmetry to the skull. So um, there was a concern that he had a possible skull fracture from trauma hit by car or, or something like that. So this is the, the mule deer. Um, so this is the left side, this is the right side. Um, it's a little difficult to make out in, in this picture, but um, you notice the, the right side isn't quite the same as the left side. There's and a little closer. So this is the right side is more round where, where this one is, is kind of a, has an angle to it. Um, and showing the, the, this is a picture showing the base of the antlers. Um, this is the, the left side that's more normal. And the right side, you can see the, the skin is kind of retracted on this side from the, the base of the antler. Uh, there's a little bit of pus coming out on, on that side. And just this is the, this picture is of that side of the, the antler. And the skin should come up to here like this. Um, and you notice there's the skin is pulled away and there's kind of a defect in the antler. And actually I didn't take a picture of it, but there's kind of a defect in the, the bones of the skull. That's why you kind of have this um, flattening of the skull and this, this angle there. So, So taking out the brain, this is the fresh brain, this is the fixed brain. Um, this is a little, little easier to, to see on the, the fixed brain, uh, but there's kind of this mass that was corresponded to being right underneath that right antler. And after it's fixed um, and cross section of the brain, that mass was a large abscess. And on the histopath, it was, it was just a you know, typical abscess. Um, there's uh, the brain out here. This is the fibrous capsule the abscess. And this is the abscess material here in the center. This is just kind of a picture of the, the abscess material with all the neutrophils and debris. And we also macrophages out here. So Truparella pyogenes was cultured from the abscess um, because he was acting um, neurological and, and in poor body condition. One of the main um, differential diagnosis for this guy was chronic wasting disease, but it was not detected. Um, in, in this deer. 
So for diagnosis, he had the antler abscess, um, osteomyelitis of the skull and a brain abscess. And this is actually a, a syndrome in deer called the brain abscess syndrome. And to go into a little bit about that, it sporadically occurs in, in deer at elk, um, mule deer and white-tailed deer, and I, I assume other species of deer, but it's by far most prevalent in white-tailed deer. Um, most, uh, greater than 85% of <clears throat> deer with brain abscesses um, occur in males older than, than one year um, of age. So it, this happens in older male deer because, you know, males sometimes aren't the brightest in the world <laughs> and start fighting each other. So it mostly occurs in the southeastern United States. Um, in the white-tailed deer. Uh, and then there are some local populations of white-tailed deer where this syndrome accounts for um, about 10% of the deer mortality. So there are some areas where it's fairly common. And it's most commonly caused by Truparella pyogenes, but there are some other bacteria that could cause it like staph and other things, but most commonly it's the, the Truparella. And Depending on when you went to school, uh, this particular bacterium has been known as a crinibacterium and actinomyces or, or arcanobacterium, uh, but now it's a, the, the Truparella pi pyogenes. So it's a normal commensal skin of the skin and mucous membranes, um, but ruminants, domestic ruminants and wild ruminants and swine, um, didn't have problems with this um, bacteria causing disease, mainly abscesses. So it is an opportunistic pathogen. Um, it's often found in polymicrobial infections, particular with fusel, particularly with Fusobacterium necrophorum. And like I said, it's often found in, in necrotic tissue and, and abscesses. So how does this um, brain abscesses develop in these deer? Well, there, there's often an injury, injury to the antlers, um, whether that's, you know, while they're still in the velvet or later when they're mature, when they're, they're fighting, um, then they'll end up with, a, you know, abscess around that antler, particularly antler base, whether it's in the skin or something caused by the Truparella pyogenes, you end up with osteomyelitis of the skull and that progresses to the, the brain abscess. So. <clears throat> so the question is, why, why does this seem to be so prevalent in certain populations of white-tailed deer? Actually, people have, have studied that. Um, in those populations of white-tailed deer, the, there's strains of the Truparella pyogenes that have increased virulence. And those strains of bacteria and those populations of white-tailed deer can be linked back to a Wisconsin game farm where back in the early 20th century, um, white-tailed deer were purchased from that game farm to repopulate uh, populations in, in various states. Um, mainly in the, the southeastern um, United States. So that's all I have on that one. So are there any, any questions? Uh, the question is, Truparella is like Cranibacterium? Um, yes. Um, yeah, one of the old names used to be Cranibacterium. Um, so I assume based on morphology and biochemical, um, and the biochemical, uh, what am I looking for? Um, mechanisms or um, 
or biochemistry that the, the bacteria use to survive um, are similar to karate bacteria. That's probably why it was initially named that. Um, and, a, and a lot of the renaming is done by genetic analysis. They'll analyze the um, mitochro, you know, the, the DNA and, and say, well, okay, it's most like The, you know, it's similar to this genus, so we will put it in, into that genus. So. And another question, has it been associated with contact of white-tailed deer with other livestock like sheep or goats? Um, I'm not sure I under, understand that question. Um, the, the Truparella itself is a pretty common commensal of a lot of animals, um, including ruminants. Um, ruminants are one of the species where disease caused by the um, by that particular bacterium tends to be common, um, especially as things become necrotic and and more chronic, um, like a lot of chronic pneumonias and 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 cattle or you know sheep and goats you'll end up with just an infection of, of Truparella because you know everything else has come and done it, come and done its thing and gone and you're just left with the, the necrotic tissue and abscesses in there. Um, so it's not really, you know, from the white-tailed deer, it's just more of a commensal that it's picked up from, you know, the, the, uh, the other animals. But, um, but yeah, the, the brain abscesses are, are, that syndrome is pretty, pretty unique to, to deer, uh, mainly the white-tailed deer. But um, yeah, we, we, I've seen it in elk and, and mule deer in, in New Mexico, but nothing to the frequency that they see it in a white-tailed deer. So. so any other questions? Uh, the question is, is it more common in, in captive servants? Um, I don't know. Um, most of the, um, the literature I've seen that uh, have talked about it in, um, in wild servants, um, mainly because it, it's usually the clinical signs are usually fairly similar to the chronic wasting disease. Um, other than the fact that, you know, usually animals deer with chronic wasting disease are pretty thin where, you know, the typically the, the deer with uh, the brain abscesses are, are still in pretty good shape. Um, I, I'm sure it happens in, in captive servants, but as, as far as increased incident, I, I wouldn't think so. Um, I don't think they, they, yeah, they may not let them as fight as much as the, the, um, the wild white-tailed deer. So. Okay, but there are no further questions. I think we'll, we'll uh, move on. And we'll continue with our, our theme of, of wasting. Um, except this one is, was a mountain lion that was it's pretty much wasted away. So. so this girl, she was a young adult female. Um, she was pretty skinny. She only weighed about 38 pounds. Um, she was radio collared as, as part of a, a study somebody was doing. Um, um they um noticed a mortality the radio collar sent out a quote unquote mortality signal um when they you know usually when they don't move for a while the radio collar sent out a signal so and you know they noted that she was in pretty poor poor body condition uh, when they found her so, dead so. 
These are segments of her small intestine that were opened up. And they're dark red because all of this is blood. And if we go closer, you can see, I'm not sure how many they are. They're literally thousands when I opened the, the intestine, but um, so these are all nematodes, these small white squiggly things. And just to prove that this is some of those guys underneath the, the, the dissecting scope. I couldn't get close enough to get a very good picture of their, their mouth parts, but we didn't send them off to a actual parasitologist to identify them. And they were identified as Ancelostoma, uh, I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation, but tuba forme. So this uh, poor uh, cougar had hookworm disease with uh, quite a severe infestation of hookworms. So Ancelostoma um, can infect fel canids, felids, um, humans, um, and actually quite a few species. Um, said in, in the non-human ancelostomas, uh, the hookworms, uh, there could be a significant zoonotic potential. Um, so they're, the parasites usually found in warmer clients, climates. Um, there's two ways that an animal become infected. Um, one is oral where the, the animal swallows the larvae, they, they go to the stomach and, and the intestine and mature to adults. Um, and the other was percutaneous, um, where the larvae will, will burrow into the skin, migrate to the lungs, get coughed up and swallowed. And then once they're in the stomach and intestine, mature into adults. Uh, the pre patent period for most Ancelostoma species is 22 to 25 days. And yeah, kind of already went through that slide. Um, just talking about how the, the different uh, routes of infection. Um, I said, as you can tell by what we saw in the intestine of this um, mountain lion, Ancelostomas are voracious blood suckers. Uh, with severe cases, you end up with anemia, loss of body condition, and poor growth in young animals. Um, in non-host species, you can end up with cutaneous and, and visceral larval migraines, particularly in, in, in people that are infected with um, non-human hookworms. Um, and uh, from what I read, the host range of these uh, Ancelostomas are, appear to be expanding. Um, to mainly to the interaction of um, dogs and cats with um, more naive um, wildlife species. Um, uh, an example, as an example exemplified by this case, um, in um, the infection in, in wild felids such as the, this mountain lion is probably due to spill over from um, domestic cats. Um, Wherever this mountain lion ranged, there was probably a lot of domestic cats in, in that area. So any, any questions about um, that? And uh, well, before we, uh, before we go on, I will mention that uh, you know, a lot of the, um, the zoonotic potential of, of these parasites is mainly in countries with 
where the sanitation is not as good as you know the the western countries the us and and, and europe and, and countries like that so um is this a a new mexico case uh yes it is um it was in southern new mexico i think um were there other conditions in the mountain lion that may have weakened it and made it so more susceptible to parasites um it was um i don't, I don't know if they were weaned yet or not but it did have um two cubs um so that at, you know taking care of the cubs may have um you know weakened it and because it you know was pretty young it may not have been the the best mother yet um so yeah it, you know it that could have predisposed it to to develop a, a large infestation um were there other any other parasites um not in in this case or not any that were uh, identified um, but they could have been hidden by just uh, the severe <laughs> extremely large number of the the hookworms. Any other questions? I think we have time for maybe one more and then we call it an evening. All right, well, venture away from our wasting theme and um, talk about a dog that thought was to have kennel cough, but it had something much, much worse. Um, this was a one-year-old um, castrated male pit bull terrier. Um, it was in pretty good body condition. It was a, a stray um, that was in, in a recently housed in a, in a shelter. Um, they neutered it and vaccinated it, um, vaccinated it. Uh, it. While it was there, it started coughing um it stopped eating and then two days later after it started coughing it was found dead in his kennel so these are the lungs of the guy um there's very little normal lung here most of it's red dark red and, and consolidated there's probably a little patchy normal lung there Said microscopically, this is normal lung. I'm just showing you that to get an idea of what normal lung looks like. These are two images of the disease lung. Um, said the, the, the area is kind of varied. Um, some areas had more separative bronchopneumonia, but some areas had more necrosis and hemorrhage like this on the right and if you go close enough on the areas of necrosis and hemorrhage you'll see these little blue dots so those are bacteria cocci bacteria And Streptococcus so epidemicus was isolated from the lungs of this dog. So this dog had a hemorrhagic suppurative bronchopneumonia caused by strep zo. And <clears throat> Streptococcus so epidemicus pneumonia is a fairly recent cause of fatal hemorrhagic pneumonia in dogs. Um, the disease hasn't been around too long. Um, typically seen in shelter or kennel or, or breeding facilities. Um, most of the cases we have had here at VDS have been from shelters. Uh, it's the, the pneumonia is usually rapidly fatal with a short clinical course of clinical signs, which are usually coughing, fever, depression, and 
and dyspnea. Um, surprising, there is another um, disease that looks clinically and pathologically similar, and that causes a hemorrhagic pneumonia similar to strep. So, and that's extraintestinal E. coli. So some dogs will have an E. coli pneumonia that it clinically looks pretty much the same with the same rapid course and grossly and microscopically, it looks almost the same, except there's usually more vasculitis with E. coli and then the bacteria or bacilli, not cocci, and then um, um, on culture, you'll will, will isolate the E. coli and not the, the strep so. so. And I think that's all I have on that one. So yeah, let's um, have a question in the chat. Was this a recent case in New Mexico um, last year, I think? I'm trying to remember. It was either last fall, winter 2020 or the spring of 2021. I, there's about four of these cases that kind of blend together and I forget which one I, I chose. Um, they, they all occurred within that, that time frame. Uh, another question, is the strep very contagious? Does it move through kennels or breeding facilities? Yes, it is pretty, pretty contagious. If, if they, they don't get a, a handle on it, it can uh, spread and infect multiple, multiple dogs. Um, it, a lot of the, the shelters that, that will send them here um, seem to do a pretty good job of getting a hold of, on, on top of it because we'll only get like one or two dogs, um, you know, around the same time from the, the, the same shelter, but they're if you, you know, will pay attention to like the AVMA news or, you know, other news sources like that, there'll be a, you know, a little article every once in a while where, you know, some shelter has, you know, or a kennel has been shut down because they've had an outbreak of, of this uh, strep. So, so it, yeah, it seems to be pretty contagious. And there's another question. Have you seen cases in, in pigs in New Mexico? Um, the, the, the answer is no, uh, but we typically don't see very many pigs for ne necropsy in New Mexico, um, mainly because there's not very many pigs here. And that brings up another point that I was, was going to bring up. Um, there's the Streptococcus zoopidemicus is has actually jumped into pigs as well, and, and can cause pneumonia and septicemia. Um, the the NVSL, the USDA NVSL, that was looking at, um, they were you know kind of typing, um, you know you know, strep zoo isolates um, from dogs and pigs and to see how they compared um, the, you know, the pig isolates tended to, to group together and then the dog isolates tended to group together and, and they weren't very, the dog isolates and pig isolates weren't, you know, weren't very closely related, but, you know, those in isolated from pigs were closely related and those isolated and dogs were closely related. So it, it, um, it doesn't seem to be the, the same type of strep zo that's infecting pigs, that's infecting the dogs. Uh, is strep zo epidemic is reportable? Um, no, I, I, I think that, you know, the NVSL was just looking at it as, as uh, because you know, it is becoming fairly common in, in pigs. And they were just looking at it uh, to study it and, and try to get a, an idea of, of what type of, um, you know, bacteria that 
that the pigs have. Yeah, you know, they were mainly concerned about the pigs that they were just doing the dogs as a comparison as, as kind of a side project. Yeah, right now they've actually quit doing, you know, typing the dog isolates. They just are mainly focusing on the pigs. Hey, John, how does the canine isolate compare to the uh, equine strips up? Oh. Can't let you off easy. That I'm not sure because the the reports they they sent back from NVSL they were just typing the the pigs with the compared to the dogs. And I can't remember how they grouped them in comparison with the the horses. Thanks. So yeah, I can't really answer that question, but I'm. I, I'm assuming it made the jump somewhere along the line. So, well, if there are no further questions, um, I think we're, it's about eight o'clock. So I think we um, are close to wrapping it up. So yeah, if there's any questions for, for anyone, then um, you know, speak up or otherwise. Thanks everyone for attending and have a good evening. Really appreciate it, John. Uh, it's not easy to do. Well, it's um, yeah. It it may not seem like it, but the, I I kind of enjoy it. You know, keeps me on my toes. Thank you. I have to. I have to learn something. So. <laughs> we'll talk soon. All right. Uh, good night, everyone. <laughs>